one of our political parties at least, ought to come down from the mountain and represent the interests and the needs and the aspirations of the producers of this great country, which are the workers and the farmers. <laughs> Otherwise, farmers and labor may be forced to repeat our history and forge yet another political alliance outside the two major parties to do that job. And I guess it's fair to say we never won too many elections in those alliances of yore, but we did sure as hell forge some changes that were awfully good for America. Secondly, I guess I'm saying that cutting social programs is not going to help farmers or put America back to work. Thirdly, we're saying a healthy farm economy depends upon a newly designed food delivery system that does not depend on mystical and disastrous free market forces. Fourthly, we're stating that economics is nothing more than, that Reaganomics is nothing more than uh, the trickle-down system of the past that never worked then, is not working now, and will never work in the future. Fifthly, we're pointing out that much of Reagan's military buildup is needless, and it, and not Social Security, is bankrupting the country. And sixth, we're asking that the United States corporations start investing at home instead of abroad. Wage competition is not a true nor a valid issue in international trade. We can't compete with overseas economies when our employers are investing in those economies rather than in our own. And the bottom line of all, I guess, is that we believe that the machinist union wants the same things as the NFO wants, peace and prosperity for all. And that says it all. Meanwhile, uh, I guess I'd say good luck at the penny auctions. Don't take any wooden nickels. And let's wean the two-headed calf from the corporate packs. Let's have our own. We can get 10 bucks of bang from every one buck that we put in a pack because we know how and because there are more of us than there are of them. So let's have our packs. Let's cough up a meager dollar here and there so that we can get out there and at least do the rudiments of a decent campaign that will appeal to the heart and the conscience of America and drive these corporate coddling carpetbaggers out of Washington, D.C. once and for all. Have a Merry Christmas, a joyous holiday season, and thank you one and all. for many, many years. His experience in the organization goes back perhaps to, if not the very beginning, and all the ups and downs and turns and corners that the organization has been through. He's been on the radio or on the tapes, and even at one point we had our television programs that he was responsible for. And so he's recognized by face and voice, and so I told uh, Phil that uh, we want him to take some time this afternoon and so I'm, I don't know what he can talk about. Knowing Phil, it could be anything. So I suppose uh, your guess is as good as mine, and when he gets through, uh, we know whether it was a wise decision or not. Phil? I thought, uh, Devon, I'd give the pleasant part of the speech first, and uh, then the controversial part will be about in the middle and then you'd better have a kind of a hook ready as in the gong show because if my personality deteriorates, you'd be ready to sort of pull me off the stage, okay? I'd like to begin by recognizing some three ladies who have worked very hard during this convention behind the scenes. They've been phoning out, uh, as we call the news actualities or news statements, every day of this convention. 
It started out to be a forenoon job, but um, we did a more thorough job of it, and it grew sort of by like Topsy. People from different delegations would come up and want radio stations in their own states to be phoned. So the ladies did that, and it turned out to be an all-day-long job. Their names are Donna Sanford of Lebanon, Kentucky, Jane Heeb of Buffalo County, Wisconsin. Now, these are volunteer efforts. Incidentally, Jane Heeb writes a column for the National Hog Farmer. And the other is Colleen Baker, who is the artist for the NFO reporter in the home office of NFO. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, Colleen did the um, cartooning on some of the brochures. This cartoon, of, that's me, you know that? My wife thinks that it's better looking than I am in person. And it may be. Now for the controversial part. In order that you know where I'm coming from, so that you will know some necessary things about those prejudices which we all have, and which in my case have affected my attitudes toward farm organizations, maybe even including this one, or maybe the national board, even those who have two-year terms left, and uh, commodity groups, uh, let me tell you that I used to teach speech. Uh, excuse me, speech. <laughs> Page two. Now look, this is serious, and I don't want any giggling out in the audience, because this affects every one of you. You don't need to take notes, but it affects you. You ask how would a crazy thing like teaching speech affect one's attitude towards, say, the National Grange, or the American Soybean Association, or the beekeepers group in the Hold Your Honey Association. So let me explain. We scientists in the field of oral communication have learned that people actually shy away from certain situations where they are likely to have to say or pronounce certain words or phrases which bother them. Or they will, they've even been known to change localities, to go uh, where the names of things have a more pleasing sound. They will start trimming their conversation to emphasize sounds or words uh, which they say well or pronounce well, and to avoid those words or phrases which they regard as unattractive. I think the best illustration of this in the field even of professional speakers was on the old Mary Tyler Moore show. Do you remember Mary Tyler Moore played the part of a, a lady who gets newscasts together and she would hand them to a newscaster whose name was Ted Baxter. One time Mary handed Ted Baxter his copy for him to go into the studio to start rehearsing and the lead story was about the death of Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia and, of course, the dateline of the story was Addis Ababa. Well, now, Ted Baxter couldn't make up his mind whether you pronounce that Addis Ababa or Addis Ababa. It's a question, you know, of getting the emphasis on the right syllable. So he came back out of the studio uh, yelling and roaring and complaining, and he said, what do you mean having that lead story from Addis Ababa? You know I can't pronounce that word. Now, this is what I'm talking about. And it might affect everyone in this room. How does this affect farm organizations? First, let me explain what we speech professors call the lateral S. Ideally, in the well-shaped mouth, the sibilant or hissing consonants come out of the front of the dental arch and through an orifice formed by the tongue and the upper and lower incisors, right? <laughs> this is where we encounter the letter S, or in some cases the letter C, as in the word citation, or in Western Hemisphere Spanish, uh, the letter C as in cielito lindo, or por cierto, which means certainly, or it's, it's the same thing, really, that Minnesota farmers mean when they say, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. 
So much for the normal S, which comes through an orifice in the front of the dental arch. And that brings us to the lateral S. The lateral S is called that for the same reason that we refer to a lateral pass in football. It's thrown sideways. Similarly, when a sibilant consonant is projected sideways out of the mouth, it's called the lateral S, and it's formed, or I should say malformed, by the tongue and the cuspids and bicuspids on either side of the dental arch, or both sides simultaneously. People who have this problem usually don't have much fondness for the word perspicacity, right? It comes out perspicacity. Or a minister in some churches where they use the word vicissitudes a lot. Vicissitudes, right? Those who study the demography of certain speech patterns have taken note of people from, say, Mississippi, who have even been known to move to Ohio because of this problem. Or lateral S sufferers from Massachusetts have been known to move to, say, Idaho. <laughs> now, I want, especially the leaders of this organization, I want you to take this thing seriously because we're not here for, this is a working convention, have you noticed? Of course, you can see that there's no sibilance in Ohio or Idaho. Now, how does this affect farm organizations? We did some research on this, Don Mack and I, uh, because we have tape recorders, and he can even edit tape. And we went around to the various hotel lobbies at this convention here in Louisville among the delegates. We were trying to find out if any among you are lateral S sufferers and have perhaps opted for the NFO because of any trauma that you associated with ideas or theories of other groups or where you were, had to mouth over too much sibilance. Because you know NFO doesn't have a sibilance problem. It's NFO, right? Uh, or collective bargaining. There's no sibilance in that, is there? or blocking production. So the awful fact about this speech is that I'm accusing most of you in this audience of delegates of suffering from the lateral S and having escaped from other organizations or groups because there is no sibilance problem in the NFO. So now let's try this out. Even the names of our leaders don't have the sibilance problem. Devon Woodland, there's no S in it. Bob Arndt, right? Phil yeah, Phil Allen, he suggests. Of course, or even the Ayatollah of the budget, Bruno Grand. <laughs> of course, when you get to some of the names like uh, Rene Nice or um, Dave Kozacek, you do have the problem. But some people have already, you know, formed certain mental defenses about things like that. Now let's take some of the words that I think have caused you to leave your previous associations and join the NFO because we have solid ideas like blocking and collective bargaining. And here are some of the ideas that have caused you traumas and feelings of guilt and bad associations in the past. Free market system. The law of supply and demand. Efficiency. Wait and see. <laughs> Straddling the fence. Agribusiness. 50 cents a hundredweight tax. You see, you wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for those ideas which you had to suck off, see? <laughs> Herbicide. Earl Butts. 
insecticide, export subsidy, expensive storage capacity, Siba <laughs> Geige, Monsanto, Shell Oil, Exxon, Standard Oil, Lasso, Bigfoot Lorspan, <laughs> Central Pivot Irrigation, Selling Short, USDA, Senate Ag Committee, House Ag Committee, Anticipated Receipts, <laughs> Agricultural Census, Consumer Price Index. <laughs> now, the Minnesota delegation are going to have to behave yourselves over there. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Chicago Board of Trade, Statistical Reporting Service, well, of course, I could go on endlessly with all this, but I'm afraid that I'd get the same treatment as in the gong show. I'd like to end on a, a serious note, perhaps. Perhaps it's serious. When Jack Crowner talked to us, he mentioned that uh, the network of radio and TV stations that he's a part of is going to go satellite. And he mentioned some 50 stations. In the offing is a satellite hookup for Here's Info, and uh, I don't want to play one-upsmanship with Brother Crowner, who I regard as one of the finest news, uh, farm news broadcasters in the country. He talks sense. But our satellite hookup, probably within a year, perhaps not, will involve about a thousand stations, coast to coast. Jack also said some things to you which I think uh, apply to us, and that is that in the beginning, in his career, and also in mine, and Don Mack, we had to learn, and learn the hard way sometimes, uh, the uses of tape and tape editing, and the immediacy of the microphone, getting it on the scene, and we have learned all of the techniques now. Incidentally, I'd like to mention that the Kansas network. Among those radio stations and networks that the three ladies have been phoning all day long, one of them, the Kansas network, said that ours were the best feeds they'd gotten from any of the conventions from the standpoint of production and editing and all that. So we take that as a compliment. And we think that the production of Here's Info and the feed outs have earned a reputation like that. We've been on some stations more than 15 years. So we'll wait and see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>